the day of atonement is and was a high and holy day for Jews. It is also called today Yom Kippur. And for modern Jews, it was a day for fasting, sober reflection, a chance to talk to those people you may have wronged in the previous years and ask forgiveness. A very meaningful day. But if you want to fund it, you need to go back in history, go back to the Day of Atonement as it was practiced in Jerusalem before the destruction of the temple. That was a good job. The Day of Atonement for ancient Jews was about restoring relationships, putting back together what had gone wrong between themselves and God, and between themselves and other people. And of course, the way that that is done, because if you're an ancient Hebrew person, according to the ancient Hebrew mind, it is with blood. The only way to repair a broken relationship is with the blood of sacrificial animals. And so the Day of Atonement was about covering over with blood all that had gone wrong in various relationships. And that's what the name means, covering over. Starting all over again. The day began, therefore, with blood. And the priest would take a bull. And he would sacrifice it on the altar. And then he would take the blood from that sacrifice. And with that blood, he would enter into the Holy of Holies. That most inner sanctuary of the, deep, of the people of God. And there in the Holy of Holies, they believed... God abided like no place else. The priest went into the Holy of Holies and used the blood of that bull to repair his relationship with God. The idea being, of course, that you couldn't help someone else to repair their relationships unless your own was right. So it started with the priest. But I'm not especially interested in the priest this morning. The people's part of the rituals of the day were far more interesting. The next thing that would happen was that the priest would take two goats, two beautiful, perfectly formed goats, and present them to the people. And he would cast lots. And the goat that won the lot had the privilege of being sacrificed. On the temple, his blood again carried into the Holy of Holies, on behalf of the people. I don't really call that winning, but that's how it worked out. I'm not interested in that goat. I am particularly interested in the second goat, the goat that was not sacrificed. And this goat was called for Azazel, that is the Hebrew word that is used. This goat was for Azazel. That Hebrew word means that it was for removal, for taking away. Now, when William Tyndale created the first English translation of the Bible from original languages over 500 years ago, he looked at that word Azazel in Hebrew, and he didn't quite know how to translate it. And he struggled with that word. And finally, Tyndale decided to invent an entirely new word for the second goat. And he called it the escape goat. That is to say, the goat that got to escape, as opposed to the other one that got burnt up. But when he wrote it down in his Bible over 500 years ago, spelling was kind of like an optional thing in English. So he dropped the opening E, and he just called it the scapegoat. Well, from there, that word scapegoat made its way into the English language, and it has since taken on a life of its own. And so today, we still talk about scapegoats, right? And for us today, a scapegoat means some individual or group who is unjustly blamed for bad things that are happening. Tyndale invented that word. We've changed it into something else. 
that's not what the original word meant. And so I don't want to talk about the scapegoat today. I want to go back to Tyndale's original understanding, and I'm going to talk about the escapegoat. So we can understand the difference. So what was the escapegoat for the original people of Israel? Well, the escapegoat seems to have been a way for them to take all that negative energy that was there in their community. You know, anytime you have people who are, are living alongside one another, working together, passionately defending their ideas in the community, you know what's going to happen? Things are going to go wrong. Someone over here is going to say something that hurts someone else's feelings. Maybe even not even being aware of it. Someone will fail to appreciate what someone else is going through or has gone through. Things go wrong in those relationships. And of course, when you have people who passionately believe in what they are doing, you also have people who disagree with one another. And that can create bad feelings. And so what, this, what the escape code was for these people was a way of taking all of that negative energy, all of that negativity, all of those hurts and bruises, and mistakes and regrets, and just dumping them. Because sometimes, you know, you have to do something physical. You have to, to, to physically move to get rid of something like that from your life. And so the escape goat formed the focus of all that negativity. They dumped it on the escape goat. Let it go. But I think that is something that we all need. It's something we need in the life of the church. You know, I, I, I understand that sometimes people come along to a church and they say, you know what? The church should be a place where that stuff doesn't happen. Where we should always agree about everything. Where we, where we should never do anything that might hurt someone or, or fail to understand their feelings and what they're going through. You know what? If you come to a church, with that expectation, you're going to have a rude awakening sooner or later. Because it doesn't work like that. Yes, we try harder here, I hope, than in the world to respect and, and love one another. And yes, we draw on God's power and strength to do that, but still we're human. Still we fall short and, and hurt and wounds and things go wrong. And we need it too. We need a way to get rid of that negativity, get rid of the hurt, get rid of the regrets, get rid of it all, so that it doesn't become the narrative of our community. That's what the escape, the escape go did for the ancient people of Israel. It, it, it offered that focus to get rid of that stuff. And so the, the goat was brought before them, and all of that was laid upon the goat, and then it was simply let to go on its way, chased out of the camp, laid out of the city of Jerusalem, set free to live out the remainder of its life as it pleased, but away from the people. That was the idea. That is how it is originally presented there in the book of Leviticus. But then something happened. Over the years, as, as the people continued to observe this day of atonement, they started adding things to this ritual of the escape goat. New traditions developed. One of the first traditions was this. They started each year attaching a piece of wool that had been dyed the color scarlet to the head of that goat. And you need to understand that scarlet dye was very rare and very expensive in the ancient world. So they could rest assured that if they put that scarlet color on the head of that goat, it would be the only goat out there marked in that way. There would be no mistaking which one was the escape goat. 
Perhaps this was because there was a worry that maybe once the escape goat had been let go into the wilderness, it might come back. It might wander back a few days later into the streets of the city. And the people were, were worried that that might mean that all of that negative energy that they let go of had come back to haunt them. And so they felt that the escape goat had to be marked. That was okay, I don't have a big problem with that. But as years went on, other traditions began to develop around the escape goat, as is attested in a number of rabbinical sources. They began to abuse the goat. The goat wasn't just released and let to go on its way. As it says in Leviticus, they started to beat it with reeds. They started to pull out its hair and prick it with thorns and spit upon it and chase it out of the city. The kind of abuse that would be condemned in a moment by PETA or by the SPCA became a common feature of the Day of Atonement. I think it was kind of an emotional release. I mean, just like they had tried to, to let go of all those negative feelings by laying them on the head of the goat. They wanted to get rid of all of those bad feelings in another physical way by, by taking out the, the anger that they may have felt for one another on some other target, on a scapegoat. I don't think it was the best way to deal with it. But that is what they did. Finally, there was one more tradition that was added. I suspect it happened one year when the escape goat did in fact wander back into the city. And people saw it appearing on the streets, carrying that scarlet wool on its head. They said, oh no, all of that stuff we let go of, it's come back, it's going to destroy us again. And so they vowed that kind of thing could never happen again. And so a new tradition is added. From that year on, they did indeed release the goat. They took it to the wilderness, let it go. It's just that they were holding it on top of a really high cliff when they let it go. They made sure that goat was not coming back. Anyways, these were the traditions. These were all of the, the various rituals that were added to the escape boat ritual in the Day of Atonement the year after year. And by the time Jesus came along, all of these traditions were firmly established and took place every year. And Jesus and all of his disciples, even if they only rarely went to Jerusalem, would have been entirely familiar with all of these traditions. And that's why I find it, I find it very interesting that when the early church came to write down what had happened to Jesus, on that day he was taken out of the city to be crucified by the Romans, they told that story in such a way as to play up all of the parallels between what had happened to Jesus and what happened every year to the escape goat. The parallels are amazing. I mean, we're told that, that Jesus was dressed in a scarlet robe, that rare and expensive dye that you never saw. No Jew could have seen that color and not thought of the escape goat. Connection was clear. And of course, we're told that Jesus was beaten with reeds, that his hair was pulled, that he was spat upon, that he was pierced with reeds. All of those things that happened every year. That poor escape goat. So, for some reason, when the early church thought to describe what had happened to their Lord Jesus, they naturally turned to this ritual. Not just because the imagery was so similar, but also to make a point. For the early church began to see Jesus very early on as the scapegoat, as the fulfillment 
of everything that the escape goat had been. For the ancient people of Israel, that Jesus had finally accomplished what the ritual of the escape goat had never completely done, had finally taken away from them all of that negative power to destroy their enemies. We need that. We need an escape goat. Because whenever we are there, whenever we are living alongside one another, as a Christian family, things go wrong. We disagree with one another, sometimes passionately, because we believe very strongly. Sometimes when we disagree, we may even hurt one another. I hope we don't mean to, but it does happen because we are human. And we fall short. And that kind of negative energy does build up in the church, and we need to get rid of it. And who does that for us? Our escape. Jesus is there to take all of that negative power, all of that negativity, carry it away. I don't need to tell you that in the life of the church, we will sometimes disagree. I don't need to tell you that because immediately after the service today, we're going to have our annual meeting. Chances are we'll have a ton of opportunities before we leave this building to disagree with one another. And you know what? That's fine. Sometimes we need to disagree with one another. I hope we do it constructively. I hope we do it with respect. But we might fall short. We need our escape. Let me just ask you. Do you carry any bitterness, any regret, any hurt? from your life in the church, maybe this congregation or some other one? Have you ever been hurt? Have you ever been disappointed by a fellow believer? Have you ever disappointed yourself by, by hurting another? By what you did to them or by what you failed, failed to do for them? And you've never been able to ask for forgiveness. You carry around her. These things do happen in the life of the church. Just like they happen everywhere else. What's different about the church is this. The church is the place where those kinds of things are not the final word. Where those kinds of things do not find the tone of our community because we have ways to get past all of that with forgiveness with grace with the power of God that gives us new beginnings so if you're carrying any of that I encourage you to go to Jesus talk to him openly honestly of what you are carrying whether it be guilt whether it be hurt he will give you what you need. He will give you the strength to go and, and to talk to someone about your regrets or about your hurts if that's what you need to do. He will give you the strength to change, to let go of that pride or whatever it is that's keeping you from changing if that's what you need, if you let him. But go to him and talk to him. He is our escape. Let's take a few moments in silent reflection. Yes, Lord Jesus, we have been hurt. We have been disappointed. We have failed ourselves and others. And we have not trusted in you. Let not our faults and failures be the 
defining word of this, your church, though. Let us, by your grace, lay these things upon you. And move on with the strength that you give us. <laughs> 